Well, good morning. Thank you for the Ministry of Music. And uh, thank you for the day uh, Karen Andrews and a team of people have put the day together and also made these lovely little palm crosses. I, there should be enough for everyone. If you didn't get one as you came in, please pick one up on the table as you go out. Just a, a good reminder. Keep it where you, where you can see it. This morning, <clears throat> I went out into our garden and we have a, palm, a little palm tree growing behind, behind, behind all sorts of other stuff. And of course, everything is wet. And so I had to fight my, my way through, do I or do I not? So I climbed through all these wet bushes. And I cut off a little sprig of palm branch and stuck it in our front gate just to remind our neighbors that it's Palm Sunday. So here we are, uh, Palm Sunday. So wonderful to be together this very, very special time of the year. Eight days, the eight days from Palm Sunday through to Easter Sunday were earth-shaking and eternity-shaping days, arguably the most important days in the history of the world. And in those eight days, the city of Jerusalem, which was overpopulated with thousands upon thousands of pilgrims who'd gathered from all over the Mediterranean world to, to celebrate the Passover were gathered in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was like a, a bubbling cauldron during those eight days. And as we read the, the story, the gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, that cover the events of those days, one of the things that stands out is that those days were full of exclamations. As you read those stories, you have a pen in your hand, just underline or highlight all of the exclamations. And uh, probably for me, the exclamation that would provide us with an overarching title, if you like, for the events of these eight days is the exclamation that came from the mouth of the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. The Jewish leaders were baying for the death of Jesus, for the execution of Jesus. And he didn't want to give in to them, but they backed him into a corner. And then he kind of, he gave in to them and he spat out these words to them. See your king. Behold your king. And he pointed at Jesus. And to me, those words, that exclamation, kind of provides us with an overarching theme of those days. So from today through to next Sunday, Easter Sunday, the message is, see your king. Behold your king. Behold our king. And uh, to help us understand him more clearly, I want to focus just on three of those exclamations over this Easter series. Uh, today, the key exclamation is, Hosanna! See your king on a donkey. On Friday, as we gather around the communion table, the exclamation, it is finished, and there we'll see our king on a cross. And then on Easter Sunday, I love the exclamation that burst from Mary's lips when she, having met the risen Lord, went to the disciples huddled together and she burst into the room and she said, I have seen the Lord. And so that's what we're going to be looking at on Easter Sunday. But today, Hosanna, see your king on a donkey. But before we see our king on a donkey on Sunday, I want us to see our king at a dinner on Saturday. So let's look together at the anointing of the king. Turn to John chapter 12. Please have it open in your Bible. We're going to cover 
quite a bit of text today, so it'll be helpful for you to have it in front of you. John, the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, chapter 12. And uh, these first 11 verses are about the anointing of the king. Read with me from verse 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with Jesus. Then Mary took about a pint, that's about half a liter. Mary took about a pint of expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Picture the scene. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So that costly, delicious perfume permeated the air. It penetrated the clothes and the hair of the occupants in the room. And it irritated Judas. He was the treasurer. And he quickly calculated with his accounting mind that that perfume that she had poured out on Jesus was the equivalent of a year's wages. Serious money. And he was critical. So why wasn't that sold and given to the poor? And Jesus' response to Judas' misguided question was terse and telling. Look at verse 7. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. Leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you but you will not always have me. Now this act of Mary's was an act of extravagant love. It wasn't calculated. It wasn't measured. It was outrageous. It was outlandish. It was over the top. It was extravagant. She just saw my did it from the bottom of her heart. And it touched Jesus so deeply that he said, according to Matthew's account, I tell you that wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And that promise, that word of Jesus, is being fulfilled right now, right here, over 2,000 years later, as we are recounting this story, we are remembering her. We are seeing her on her knees, with her hair down, wiping Jesus' feet that she had anointed with her expensive perfume. What a picture. What a thing. And what she did is a call to you and me to extravagant love. That's the message that I get as I, in my mind, I see Mary do this. It's as if I'm hearing Jesus saying to me, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to show me that you love me? What costly thing might you do? You may not be able to give him a year's wages, but something, some action, some gift, some service to others, some time spent with him, something. So ask yourself, think about it. Take this away with you. This is the call to extravagant love. Now, in anointing Jesus like this, Mary did more, she, more than she knew. Jesus said, when she poured this perfume on my body, she did it 
to prepare me for burial. She didn't know that. But he knew it. He he saw more in her action than she understood or perhaps even intended. I can imagine that night when the party was over, the dinner held in Jesus' honor was done. And Jesus was shown to his bed in a guest room in the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. I can imagine him lying in bed and the fragrance of that perfume would have been strong. It was he was the one, it was his body that was anointed. Imagine him lying in bed before going off to sleep. And the fragrance of that perfume reminded him of what lay ahead of him the next day and the next week. What lay ahead of him for, as verse 1 says, the next six days. Six days from that night. Burial. Anointed for burial. But before burial, crucifixion. Imagine lying in bed knowing that six days from now you're going to die. Imagine, in, imagine lying in bed tonight knowing how you're going to die six days from now. That was Saturday night in Bethany. And when he woke up on Sunday morning, the fragrance of Mary's perfume was there, still strong. A fresh reminder to him of his mission for that day. A mission that had been prescribed, get this, 500 years earlier by the prophet Zechariah. So let's go there. Let's think about the arrival of the king, verses 12 to 19, the passage that Enoch read for us. Thanks, Enoch, for reading it so well. We got it. Thank you. As Jesus stepped out of that little home in Bethany on Sunday morning, this day, Palm Sunday, his four-legged Uber was waiting for him. He had ordered it. He had arranged it with the disciples. And as he stepped out of the door, there it was. I don't know if you've got a picture of it on his phone. Maybe not. Look at verse 12, verse 14 rather. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Here's the quotation from Zechariah. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Jesus lived his entire life by the it is written of the word of God. You read the passion accounts as I hope you will this week. You will see again and again and again that things happened so that scripture might be fulfilled. Again and again and again. He lived his entire life by the it is written of the word of God. His life is what Eugene Peterson memorably called a long obedience in the same direction. And that direction was the cross. His life was a long obedience toward the cross. And that's what he calls us as his disciples to. That's what Palm Sunday calls us to. What he did on Palm Sunday was as it was written got up that morning to do as he was written. The fragrance of the perfume on his body reminded him, this is your mission for today. Do as it is written. And that's what he calls us to do every day. To get up in the morning and to do his will. To obey his word. 
Elizabeth Elliot, missionary and Christian speaker and writer, said this, every day we must choose whether to trust God or not, to follow him or not, obey him or not. If we choose to trust, follow, and obey, then the measure of our success is not how things turn out in this life, nor in our understanding of all the cogs and wheels and machinations of just what God is doing. The only problem to be solved really is that of obedience. Did I obey? Not how did things turn out, but did I obey? Now, as Jesus stepped out of that home that morning, um, a colt was waiting, but also a crowd. A crowd had gathered, we read that earlier, that a crowd had gathered, they found out where Jesus was staying, and they'd heard about this resurrection of Lazarus. So when they heard that Jesus, the one who'd raised Lazarus from the dead, was staying in that house, a crowd gathered around the house, sort of like the press do when some big deal happens in somebody's home and the press gather and the, I mean, if, if it happened today, the, the, the TV trucks would have been there, the cameras would have been there, the reporters would have been there. And so that was the, that was the scene as he stepped out of the house. The crowd was waiting for him, not just the cult, but the crowd. And that crowd accompanied him down the Mount of Olives, down to the Kidron Valley. But the crowd that went with him was met by a crowd that was coming out of the city. All those pilgrims had heard the, the talk of the town was this man who had raised a person from the dead and done a whole bunch of other miracles before that. And so they heard that he was coming. And so these two crowds came like, like two waves coming together. And Jesus in the middle on this donkey. Have a look at verses 12 and 13. The great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. What an amazing sight. And if you've been to Israel, if you've spent time in Jerusalem, you can kind of picture the geography of that situation. A crowd pouring down from Bethany. A crowd pouring out of the city down toward the Kidron Valley. These two, these two rivers of people merging together into one and Jesus on the donkey in the middle. Hosanna, that's the exclamation. Hosanna literally means save. And on this occasion, probably save us or save us, we pray. It was, it was an anticipatory cry. They and they saw Jesus as a deliverer and they anticipated that he was going to deliver them. They quoted from Psalm 118. Interestingly, a psalm that had been quoted a hundred years earlier when the warrior Judas Maccabeus drove out the Greeks and even the palm branches were, were symbolic um, of the crowd's political aspirations. It was after that uh, deliverance under Judas Maccabeus, they minted a coin, and on the coin was the palm branch. And so for, for them, this was a political occasion. Their deliverer was coming. He was going to set them free from the hated Romans that dominated them. And that's why they were so excited. Absolutely thrilled. They wanted a king with a sword. Little did they know that they were going to get a king with a cross. And that's why they eventually turned against him. Even the disciples didn't really understand what was going on. Look at verse 16. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified 
Only after the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and Pentecost, only after that did they understand that these things, that Zechariah, these things had been written about Jesus. So when Jesus stepped out of that little home in Bethany that morning, he knew that by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, he was going to precipitate a crisis that would culminate in his crucifixion. And we read how the Pharisees said one to another as they saw the, the, the Jesus' popularity, as they saw these crowds thronging around him. They said, see, this is getting us nowhere. You can imagine them huddled in a committee meeting, you know, all agitated and frustrated. And they exaggeratingly say, look how the whole world has gone out after him. And they became even more determined to kill him. So the arrival of the king on that Palm Sunday is a call to long obedience. What Jesus did that day was just another step of obedience. He had been walking that road right from the beginning step of obedience. Now the arrival of the king is followed by the announcement of the king, verses 20 to 26. And some people, some people think that this event that we're coming to now in verses 20 to 26, some people think that it took place the next day. Uh, so in other words, this, this, what we're going to look at now happened on Monday, uh, tomorrow. Uh, perhaps so. It doesn't really matter. The point is that John, the Apostle John, in writing this gospel years later, guided by the Holy Spirit, puts these two events together for a very, very good reason. He wanted us to see these two events, the arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem and the announcement that he made. He wants to see them linked together because they are in the, in the program and purpose of God. And we, we hear the announcement of the king in verse 23. Have a look at the text. Verse 23, Jesus said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. That was his announcement. So he arrives in Jerusalem and then he makes the announcement. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And as I said, by glorified, Jesus meant everything that lay ahead of him. His suffering, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his exaltation, his ascension to heaven uh, 40 days later, the sending of the Holy Spirit as a result of his finished work on the cross. All of that is wrapped up in his glorification. And if you read from the beginning of the Gospel of John, probably five times before this, he says, the time has not yet come. The time has not yet come. You remember at the, at, the, uh, at the wedding in Cana in Galilee when they ran out of wine and Jesus' mother came to him with the problem and said, hey, they've got no more wine. What was his response? What's that got to do with me? My hour has not yet come. It's not, it wasn't time to, for him to reveal himself as the Messiah. And four more times after that. But now, after riding in on the donkey, fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy, he makes this announcement and he says, now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. But, but what led up to that announcement is of real significance, of cosmic significance, in fact. Look at, let, read with me from verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, one of his disciples, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see or have an interview with Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, another of the disciples, and Andrew and Philip, in turn, 
told Jesus. What did they tell him? There's some Greeks here who want to have an interview with you. That's what they told him. And what did he say? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He didn't say, well, where should we meet? Or have you got the donuts? Or should we have coffee? No. These Greeks want to see you, Lord. The hour has come. That is so significant. Why? Why? Jesus doesn't respond to their request for a meeting. But he responds to the situation that they, re that they represent. These are Gentiles coming to him. Gentiles coming to him. And he is going to be, by fulfilling the purpose of this hour, he is going to make it possible for a new covenant community made up of Jews and Gentiles to be gathered to him, that is, the church. Don Carson says, it seems that for Jesus, the approach of the Greeks is a kind of trigger a signal that a climactic hour has dawned. But how will he bring this new covenant community made up of Jews and Gentiles, how will he bring it into being? Through death. Through death. Jesus replied, verse 23, look at the text replies with an illustration, a surprising illustration from agriculture. He says, the hour has come, verse 23, for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That's how. That's how he's going to bring this new covenant community into being. This multitude that no one can number from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. These many seeds will be brought into being by him, the one seed being planted in Calvary's ground and dying. That's how it's going to come about. Notice his words carefully. Unless, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. I mean, you can take a mealy and you can put it in your safe and it will stay a single mealy. But you plant it in your backyard and at the end of the season, you've got 500 mealies and you plant those and you've got a whole bunch more and so you can become the mealy king. That's the way it works. So Jesus in verse 24 is saying, unless I face this hour, unless I drink this cup, unless I lay down my life, I will remain a single seed. But if I give my life, I will give birth to many seeds. I will bring many sons and daughters to glory. I will be the firstborn among many sons and daughters. So the hour had come. No life for others unless the cross, unless death for him. So if you, if you enjoy salvation today, if you, if you say, well, I'm saved, I'm, I'm a child of God, you are one of the many seeds you are one of the many seeds that has come as a result of his, of the death of that one son of God, sinless son of God seed upon the cross. And so the principle, this principle of life through death, Jesus goes on now to show that it doesn't, doesn't only apply to him. It also applies to us. Look at verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. 
Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. And so what is he saying here? He's saying that if we're going to fulfill God's purpose for our lives, if we're going to bear fruit for God's kingdom, then we're going to have to die. Not necessarily physically, and certainly not in the atoning sense in which Jesus died. But we're going to have to die to sin, to self, to our own will, to our own way, sometimes to our own plans. We're going to have to die to anything that runs counter to the, the will of God. There's no other way. There's no softer option. I think that's what Jesus had in mind earlier when he said in Luke 9, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. So that's that, that principle again. Look after the little seed, protect yourself, never do anything that's out of your comfort zone, never do anything that costs you anything, and you will make no difference in the world. But give your life away, and you will make a difference. It will mean life to others. It will mean health to others. It will mean hope to others. And it will mean glory to him. Coming back to Elizabeth Elliot, I mentioned a few weeks ago that Irene and I have just read the first of what are going to be three volumes of a new biography, an authorized biography of Elizabeth Elliot, a famous missionary and a writer, probably wrote 25 to 30 books, uh, spoke all around the world. Uh, she became famous in, at the beginning when her first husband was one of five young missionaries who were killed in the Amazon jungle by the Wadani Indian, an Indian tribe that they were trying to reach, an unreached people group. And they were all stabbed to death, speared to death in one day, five missionaries in one day, gone. And two years later, she went back into that same tribe of people who had killed her husband and his colleagues. Two years later, she went back as a defenseless woman with a 10-month-old baby <laughs> to take the gospel to those people. She spent eight years there helping to establish the church and put some of the scriptures in their language. Her first husband, she, she came back to the States then and remarried, and Ellen Vaughan, her biographer, comments that her first husband died suddenly and savagely in the jungle by being speared to death. Her second husband that she later married, he died savagely and slowly with throat cancer. But she nevertheless lived a most fruitful life, died a few years ago at the age of 85. And her biographer, Ellen Vaughan, says this. Listen carefully to this. Her most noble accomplishment was not weathering excoriating loss. In other words, the two massive, dramatic losses of her two husbands. Her most noble accomplishment was not weathering excoriating loss. It was practicing through both the high dramas and the low, dull days that constitute any human life, the daily self-death required for one's soul to flourish. It is this theme of death that gives the narrative arc of her life. This is not particularly cheerful, but if there was one empowering paradoxical element within Elizabeth Elliot that defined her to the core, it was a healthy willingness to die. Hmm. A 
again and again, believing his promise, Christ's promise, that real, robust, exhilarating life comes out of every death. Now that's totally contrary to natural thinking. My natural thinking, my natural self is, Lee, look after yourself, protect yourself. Don't do anything that costs you anything. Be comfortable, be okay, don't go out of your way. Avoid pain at all costs. Live a comfortable life at all costs. Do the minimum necessary to get by. That's, that's natural to all of us. Look after number one. Look after number one. Keep that little mealy shiny. Don't stick it in the dirty, cold ground. Look after number one. And there are many people who live their lives like that. They live like that and they die like that, having had no influence, no impact. Thank God Jesus didn't live like that. So the announcement of the king is a call to follow him in daily death. And you will have lots of opportunities, as will I, to just die to self. And that's our calling. Now, following the announcement, there's a, a glimpse into the king's heart. Look with me at just verse 27 and 28. And here we see the agony of the king. Remember, this is all connected. This is all part of this one story. If we chop it up into little bits and forget about it, we, we miss the impact of it. And so he makes the announcement. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, to go to the cross, to die. But how does he feel as he approached that hour? What was happening in his heart? Look at verse 27. He says, now my heart is troubled. Now my heart is troubled. That was what was going on inside of him. There was turmoil inside of him. Now my soul is troubled. And these words remind us of the Gethsemane accounts. If you read the Gethsemane account in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, that word is there. My soul is troubled to the point of death. In Luke, he's so troubled that he begins to sweat blood. Deeply, deeply distressed. Because he knew what lay ahead of him. His heart was troubled and his human nature shrank back at the horror that lay ahead of him. And what, what was that horror? What was the horror? Oh, it was crucifixion to be sure. But that, that wasn't the main issue. Lots of people were crucified. Thousands, hundreds of thousands perhaps in the Roman Empire. And a lot of them faced more suffering through crucifixion than he did. So that wasn't the main thing. Let's not minimize it, it was a thing. But it wasn't the main thing. The main thing that caused his agony was the realization that as he was on that cross, God, in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, would lay on him the iniquity of us all. And then God would pour out his judgment on him and treat him as if he'd committed every sin that you've committed, every sin that I've committed. That was the horror. That was the horror. We cannot understand that horror because we're, sin we're sinners. He was sinless. And he was going to be, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he was going to be made sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That was the horror. That's why he said, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Sounds like Gethsemane, doesn't it? Lord, if it is possible, take this cup from me. This is kind of John's Gethsemane, but it's not the same thing. It's, a diff it's before Gethsemane, chronologically. Save me from this hour. He considered praying. Should I say this? Should I say, Father, save me from this hour? 
But then there's this glorious resolution in verse 28, and he says, no, no, don't save me. For this very reason, I came to this hour. My whole life, my whole, from eternity, this was the plan. As the triune God in eternity planned together that this was the way God was going to reveal himself to the world. This was the way God was going to save a people for himself. That was agreed in the council of the Trinity. That's why he came into the world. That's why he was sent. And so as he thinks about it, and he says, what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, no. For this reason, I came to this hour. And then, he, and then the, these wonderful words in the end of verse 28. Father, glorify your name. Yeah, glorify your name. And surely our king's example here is a call to you and me to glorify God's name at any cost. What is the first question of the, of the catechism? What is the chief end of man, chief end of people? It's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. What did Paul say? Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, even as something as simple as that, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. Yes. So he says, Father, glorify us. So this is a call. And there are times when our hearts will be troubled. There are times when we'll shrink back. There are times we'll say, what shall I say? God, save me from this. I don't want to go this route. I don't want to pay that price. But remember, Jesus, no, for this reason I came to this hour. Remember, remember the agony. But then comes the affirmation of the king. I love this. He says, that's why this is all tied together. He says, Father, glorify your name. Verse 28, then a voice comes from heaven. Look at, listen to this. A voice, then, verse 28, then a voice came from heaven in response to his prayer, glorify your name. God speaks and he says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. God answers that glorious act of surrender by speaking from heaven. You remember he'd done this twice before. When was the first time? At his baptism, yes. As he was baptized, same thing, goes into the waters and John says, no, 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 I, I, no, no, no. Uh, you don't need to be baptized. You baptize me, you don't need to be baptized. And Jesus, what does Jesus say? It's necessary to fulfill all righteousness. This is God's plan for me. And he comes up out of the water and a voice from heaven speaks, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Mount of Transfiguration goes up the mountain with Peter, James, and John, remember? The glory there, it's wonderful, and old Peter wants to build a tabernacle and stay there and just have a liquor time of glory and, uh, and uh, in that space. What are they doing? What, what did they talk about? What did he talk about with Moses and Elijah? He talked about his exodus that he would accomplish at Jerusalem. He talked about the cross. And again, the voice from heaven, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Listen to him. And now in the midst of his agony as he chooses to do God's will, again the voice comes from heaven. He, Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. God says, I have glorified it. All your life has been for my glory. And he says, I'm going to glorify it again. In your suffering, in your death, in your resurrection, in your exaltation. I will glorify it again. Oh, I love this. This is so, so amazing. The crowd, verse 29, look at it. The crowd that heard this said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken. Can you imagine? They, just, they didn't know what was going on. Jesus said, verse 30, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. 
Now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now the prince of the world is being driven out. But when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die by being lifted up on a cross. The Jewish method of execution was stoning. They would have stoned him for religious reasons if they could because he claimed to be the son of God. The Roman method of execution was crucifixion. And the Romans had the power to choose which way Jesus died and so he was lifted up on a cross. For political reasons, because he was a threat to Caesar, according to his accusers. Amazing. Jesus says, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all people, not all people without exception, but all people without distinction. Maybe he had those Greeks in mind. So they, along with the multitude, would form part of those many seeds that would come as a result of his death. In verse 32, where he talks about being lifted up, we have echoes of what he said in his conversation to Nicodemus, you remember, back in chapter 3? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. So if you have eternal life this morning, it's because he was lifted up. It's because you have been drawn to him as you've heard the gospel message and the Holy Spirit has worked in your heart. So the words spoken by Jesus after his affirmation call us to rejoice in the meaning of his death. Now is the time of the judgment of this world. Now the prince of the world has been defeated. Now the son of man has been lifted up and he will draw all people. Oh, that's, that's, that's what we rejoice in. That's what we rejoice in. And the passage very, this, this passage we're looking at is possibly the last sermon, if you like, the last teaching time of Jesus. Maybe a few verses further on in the, in the chapter. But listen to how he rounds this off with the appeal of the king in verse 34 to 36. Verse 34, the crowd spoke up. And he's, they're addressing Jesus now. They've heard this voice, they're a bit confused by it, but they, now they engage with him. We've heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. They had chapter and verse to show that, but they didn't took it out of context and didn't understand it. But that was their understanding. The Messiah would, Messiah would never die. We've heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? And it's interesting, Jesus doesn't answer their question. And he may not answer all of your questions. Instead, he gave an urgent appeal. And I want you, especially if you're not sure that you're a Christian, I want you to listen to this very, very carefully. I want you to hear and feel the urgency of Jesus. He's on his way to the cross. His heart has been troubled. He's embraced the cross. He said, I'm going for it. Yes, yes, God. Amen. And then he says this. 
Then Jesus told them, verse 36, you are going to have, who's the them? The crowd that just said, who's the son of man? You know what's going on? Oh, let's, let's have an intellectual discussion about all this. He says to them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark doesn't know where he's going. And then verse 36, believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. That's how he ends this. This is his punchline. Believe in the light while you have the light so you become children of light. And then, notice the next sentence. When he'd finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. It's like he walked off the stage. This is over. I had my last word. Thank you very much. Whew. Don Carson calls Jesus leaving them and hiding himself from them an acted parable of judgment. An acted parable of judgment. Jesus says, I'm the light, you have the light. Accept the light while you have the chance. Because you're not going to have the chance forever. And with that, he walks off the stage. And he disappears. Goes somewhere away from the crowd. And this last sentence is left with them. I want this to be left with you this morning. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become the children of light. Believe in Christ while Christ calls you so that you may become his child. And the implication of him walking off is that you may not have this opportunity again. This may be the last call. So don't mess around. Don't delay. Jesus didn't stop and answer all their questions and get into find debates about who is the Son of Man. You'll still have questions, and that's okay. Some of them you may get answers to, some of them you won't. But come while you have the chance. Let's pray together. Just take a moment in the quietness to let this last word of Jesus land in your heart. You're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark doesn't know where they're going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. Just in your heart, turn to him and say, Lord, I believe in you. Come into my life. Forgive my sin. I want to be yours fully and forever. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for your word in which You are revealed to us. Thank you that you're here this morning speaking to us, inviting us to come into the light, to come to you.
May there be no delay. Even though our questions may not all, may not all be answered. We have answers to the big questions. Of who you are and why you came and why you died. So help us to come.